in studio with me right now. We've got a couple of guests uh, in uh, from Texas Tech University, Dr. Uh, Stephen Balk, uh, who we've had in numerous times over the last couple of years. And uh, Dr. Balk, um, this is the uh, a, a final um, lecture coming up in a, a series of lectures that y'all been putting on. That's right. This is the uh, the concluding, uh, and I think we're, we'll outdo ourselves in, in many respects this time around, the concluding lecture in our Freedom Text and Context series. Uh, that's been four lectures now uh, funded by the CH Foundation. Um, and on each occasion, we've been looking at a different dimension of freedom. Um, we do these things in conjunction with the Remnant Trust, which is a collection housed at Texas Tech of about 1,200 first and early edition texts on freedom. There'll be an exhibit opening tonight at the museum and tomorrow's lecture by Stuart Taylor. Uh, it will be uh, about due process and about freedoms on campus. I think I could fairly state that. It's going to occur 6 p.m. tomorrow in room 001 of the English Philosophy Building. Welcome everyone to come. Uh, there's parking available uh, right outside the building uh, for the public, um, so no trouble getting getting to it. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very exciting event. And in studio, we uh, do have Stuart Taylor. He's a uh, lawyer and also senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and uh, also author of the book, Until Proven Innocent, Political Correctness and the Shameful Injustices of the Duke Lacrosse Rape Case. And uh, Mr. Taylor, welcome to, to the studio. Very happy to be here. Happy to be in, in uh, West Texas for the first time. Quick correction. Uh, I parted ways with the Brookings Institution a couple of months ago, and um, now the title I use is uh, senior, I'm sorry, contributing editor at National Journal Magazine. Great. Well, uh, glad to know that. Appreciate that. And uh, tell folks a, a little bit about um, what you're going to be discussing uh, in this lecture because it is something that has, I think, been in the news for quite a while, and that is political correctness due pro and what you write about in your book, the, the, the lack of due process on college campuses. Yes. Um, I've been uh, writing on, in this area for a while. The current book, which is uh, going to be titled uh, Campus Rape Panic, the Attack on Due Process at American Universities, is about what I just described, and it's due process focused and presumption of innocence focused. Uh, but I've also written a lot, and I'll say a lot in the speech, about uh, the politically correct. That seems to be a pretty – people, I think, understand what that means. It's not easy to define. I call it authoritarian leftist attacks at the universities and by the Obama administration. This is kind of new, the government getting into the act in a big-time way, ordering the universities basically to adopt oppressive rules uh, that are unconstitutional violations of the freedom of speech in some contexts and I think of, of the rights of uh, students accused of sexual assault. Now, sexual assault may seem like it's not in the same category as free speech, but the attacks are related in part because – the attacks on free speech are now couched as efforts to prevent so-called sexual harassment or racial harassment of other students or faculty. And But when you look at what these people say amounts to harassment, uh, it's basically speech that they don't like. And often it's quite reasonable speech, but speech that they don't like. Well, and, and I, I don't know if your book takes a look at it, but you had the case where uh, Rolling Stone magazine uh, went after – uh, what turned out to be a completely false story. And there are a whole bunch of lawsuits on this. And from that, this uh, idea of rape culture being all over campus universities and that anything that, you know, you, you have maybe have a fraternity that says a joke or they or a sorority that has a, a theme party. Now that's under attack. Now yeah. those are all really bad things on university yeah. campuses. And, and we think the problem with uh, that University of Virginia case, the so-called Jackie case, is an, an alleged gang rape, a really sadistic gang rape at a yeah. fraternity, which never happened. It was all lies. Uh, that was snapped up enthusiastically by the nation's media. Uh, in spite of its gross implausibility, you know, you look at the allegations, no case like this has ever been proved. And so this one would have had to be quite extraordinary. Uh, and also by the University of Virginia, the president, the student government, the faculty, the bureaucracy, all of them 
jumped on that allegation to say we've got to cut down the fraternities, we'll close them, you know, we'll stop them from having parties for a while, mm-hmm. we've got to change the rules on sexual assault. And as the story fell apart over time, it was proven to be a complete lie. None of these people changed direction. They just kept acting as though it were true. Yeah. And that's – so we do get into that. Is it a – and I graduated from Texas Tech University, um, and, it, and it wasn't all that long ago that I graduated from Texas Tech. But it seems as though not only on the Tech campus but on college campuses in general, over the last eight to nine, ten years, this cut down on free speech, conservative free speech, I'll put it that way, uh, Republican free speech, conservative free speech has really taken off. Is it, I, of course, it coincides with the Obama administration, but is it just the Obama administration or is it, are there other competing factors that, that go into this? It was taking off in the 80s, actually, and it's kind of gained altitude from the 80s till now. Yeah. Now, a couple of court decisions in the 90s saying no campus speech codes, at least not at state campuses. Uh, let a lot of people will believe, well, that's over. Well, it's, it's not over because there's a very strong strain, I'd say a majority strain in today's faculties, of wanting to censor speech that they don't like. And, and that was very strong uh, before Obama took office, but it's only gotten stronger. <clears throat> One reason is the faculties are becoming more and more monolithically authoritarian leftist, in my phrase, over time. They kind of freeze out anybody who's not one of them. And and um, and so that's just happening by itself. But also, the Obama administration, it's been kind of it, it's been kind of a trademark. The Clinton administration did the same thing to put leftist ideologues in the civil rights agencies in the Justice Department, the Department of Education, people who are far to the left of the president. I think mm-hmm. uh, the president has made some statements about campus free speech that are. You know, sound pretty good. You know, I, you know, we got to have it sound sincere. But what his ideologue appointees are doing in his name and with his consent is censor people by telling campuses, for example, you must investigate and punish any faculty or st- faculty member, or student who commits harassment defined as any unwelcome verbal comment to anyone that they don't like on grounds of race or or sex or gender, uh, whether or not a reasonable person would be offended. Mm. You have to treat it as harassment even if the complaints from the people who are complaining are frivolous and stupid and silly. That's, you know, you have to treat it as harassment anyway. Uh, And they've really uh, driven that trend into overdrive with that with that requirement we're visiting with uh stuart taylor here on the chat ht show um college campuses now have safe spaces they have trigger warnings on on uh on campuses there was i can't remember which debate it was maybe it was the the second presidential debate where they actually posted a sign outside of the debate trigger warning mm-hmm. uh they, where that, does this lead? That was at Hofstra, I think. The yeah, first it was. It, yeah. it was Hofstra. Where, where does that lead for those who are our parents out there? They've got kids who are going to college. You have you know, because kids are growing up with this now. They're growing up with it not only in college but in high school, junior high. I mean, this is being instilled into kids. This type of um, speech codes, the, the the these type of rules and, and trigger warnings and safe spaces. What happens to those kids? When they graduate college and, oh, my goodness, I'm in the real world all of a sudden. They're going to get a, a rude shock because the, the way the colleges are treating them now and the kids are demanding it and the colleges are giving them what they want, please the customer, is anything that upsets me I want to be protected from. I want you to censor the people or at least give me a safe space or call it a microaggression. And it goes way back. I sort of first sensed something odd was going on when my two girls, who were both soccer players, uh, would come home at the end of the season and they all got trophies. Everybody got a trophy. Yeah. And nobody's trophy was any bigger than anybody else's, as in self-esteem, all these kids must be coddled all the time. If they say something stupid, uh, pretend that it's smart. And, um, you know, what's called helicopter parenting. 
Uh, but, you know, so that's one trend, and that's just a cultural trend. You know, you can't blame that on Obama or anybody else. But it intersects when you get to colleges, when you get to campuses, with the left-wing political correctness movement, which is, you know, censor things that offend people that have a conservative tinge to them, the, the, the statements. And so you have these two trends, one is which, uh, you know, people have a right never to be upset, hmm. and two of which is especially if it's upset by conservatives. Right. Now, if you call someone a right, you know, a, a dirty white privileged cad or, you know, or any other name, number of the names that are thrown at conservatives to insult them, oh, well, that's okay. It's applause. <laughs> that's okay. That is, but if you yeah. say, and this has happened all over the place, if you say – all lives matter, not just black lives. I mean, you're not saying black lives don't matter, but everybody, oh, that's a microaggression. Right. You know, you can get in trouble for saying that on a campus these days. And yeah. people have gotten in trouble. Do you think in a way the protests that we're seeing after the election of Donald Trump, the protests that we're seeing in, you know, major liberal cities, does that tie in a little bit with people who – I, I call it the participation trophy generation that, that can't accept – you lost. It, it, it's over because you didn't have all these great big protests when President yeah. Obama won election and then won re-election. Conservatives right. didn't get out in thousands in March. Yeah. No, I think there's some of that going on here. I cut him a little more slack on Trump because I don't like Trump. But, you know, so we all – where you sit is comes up. Where you stand is where you sit. But I don't cut him too much slack. So here's an example. Within the last week – the head of computer sciences at the University of Rochester got in trouble by doing the following. There was some big movement, and they were promoting it on Facebook, like saying, not my America was the slogan. Right. So he gets into the Facebook thing. He's a little tired of this stuff. And he says, if you're one of the not my America people, I have news for you, good news. There's a $16 ticket I can buy for you from Rochester to Canada, and I will get – one for anyone who promises never to come back. <laughs> well, I thought that was pretty cute. He's fired. Yeah. He is fired. Bang. Overnight. By the by the people at the top. Now I don't think he's completely fired. I think he can still teach some classes and they'll probably push him out of doing that pretty soon. Yeah. But he was immediately fired from being the head of the department. Mm. Uh, well, we had a, a, a question uh, from a caller, and, and this will be a final question that we get into. Uh, and I, I think it delves into this. They asked uh, your thoughts on, on tenure and if doing away with tenure would help move away from this thought process. And, and my question that kind of delves in this is how do college campuses get away from this mindset now? Because I think it's it's a horrible mindset to be in. How do we get away from it? It's a hard question. First on tenure. I might have said some years ago, tenure is stupid. It's a bad idea. People shouldn't have lifetime job guarantees. I have to admit I feel differently now because tenure is the only thing that's protecting the little rump minority of professors who are not left wing from being fired. If you're not tenured, you're in danger if you offend these people in any way. You've got some protection if you're tenured, you know, not total perfection, protection. So, you know, so, you know, I, you can I, – I don't think – Attacking tenure is is the way. Maybe maybe once we get colleges sane, a century or two from now, we can do that. But um, it's very hard because the faculties are now so far gone, in my opinion. You know, the at least the you know sort of the humanities faculties, the value type courses, you know, history, English, all that stuff, sociology. Um, they're so uniformly. Maybe not down here so much, but up in the northeast where I am and on the west coast, in the blue states, they're so uniformly uh, left. And, you know, a lot of them are nice people. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm friends with some of these people, but they just don't want to hear any conservative interruptions. And I think uh, I'd like to see legislatures uh, starting to use the power of the purse to force universities to present uh, more courses that, uh, say, cover real American history as opposed mm. to oppression studies. Not that oppression studies don't have a place in the curriculum, but they become, you know, more and more of that and less and less. You, my co my co-author did a study of uh, UCLA's history faculty for teachings. What do they teach in American history? 
nothing about the founding generation, nothing about the early 19th century, almost nothing about the Civil War, and very little about the stuff that I learned when I was taking history courses a long time ago, and a heavy, heavy diet of how white males have been oppressing women and how white males have been oppressing blacks for centuries and are still doing it. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a place for that. I don't really buy the still doing it part, but it's become dominant, and uh, it's going to be very hard to change that. I think another thing, people, universities, especially like you know the private universities that are supported by alumni donations, alumni need to take need to take a look at what their money's being used for. Right. Um, and students, students, I think there's a silent majority of students who don't like, you know, don't buy the protest stuff or don't buy a lot of it. Uh, they need to assert themselves. They need to stop letting themselves get, get censored. They need to start running people for student government. Unless they just want to be part of a left-wing propaganda mill, they're going to have to do something to prevent it. Stuart Taylor, appreciate your time today. And uh, one more time, Dr. Bach, if you'll uh, just give the audience particulars about the speech. Uh, he'll be speaking tomorrow about the subject you just heard. It'll take place at 6 p.m. in the English Philosophy Building, room 001. Please come. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a, a great lecture. Looking forward to it. Thank you again for coming by today. Thanks very much for having me.